Good evening and welcome to Faith Baptist Church. And this is, of course, our evening service. And once again, we have nobody in this auditorium but Brother Joe Walker. And, uh, and I sure do miss having people. I, I saw a pastor who had such a great idea is he put all the pictures of his congregation, I don't know if all, but in, in, in the seats. And so he had pictures of his, so actually he actually was looking at the faces of people in his congregation. I thought, man, what a great idea that is. And that's just a reflection of how every pastor feels. We all miss our uh, congregation, not that you're ours, but the, the congregation we get to feed and to preach to. And certainly looking forward to that that service when we can meet together and assemble together as God's people. And so, um, but till that time, we're thank God we can do these videos and that we are able to at least have uh, messages prepared for you, me and Brother Bill, so that we can still feed the flock. Uh, praying for you. Thank you for your prayers for us. Thank you for your faithful giving, by the way. Thank God for each one of you that have been doing that. And, um, and we certainly appreciate your faithfulness in that area. All right, well, let's get into the message tonight and turn over to the book of Philippians. I preached from Philippians last week. I could preach from Philippians all the time. I love the book of Philippians, as I mentioned, my favorite New Testament book. But turn over to Philippians chapter 4, Philippians chapter 4, and we're going to read just one verse, really, Philippians 4, 19. You could quote it more than likely. We have heard this verse a multitude of times. But Philippians chapter 4, verse number 19, and I'll read it to you. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Let me read that one more time. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. I want to talk to you about the joy of seeing God meet your needs. The joy of seeing God meet your needs. Father, thank you that you are a God that has promised to take care of us. Thank you that you promised to give us our daily bread, that you promised to meet our needs. And what a joy to have a God like you. What a privilege to be your child. What a privilege to be a child of the King. And so, Lord, I pray for our church. I pray you'll bless every single member of Faith Baptist Church, every single friend of Faith Baptist Church. And, Lord, I pray that you'll continue to keep us steadfast and unmovable. And, Lord, even in these days abounding in the work of the Lord. And I pray that, Lord, tonight this message will encourage people and help people to have that great joy of seeing you meet their needs. In Christ's name, amen. I've been thinking about this subject here for a little while, especially since this all happened. And I've been thinking about these past years of my Christian life. I mentioned the morning service next month will be 42 years that I've been saved. Doesn't seem possible. Can't, it just seems like it's, it's flown by. But in, in these 42 years, I've been thinking back to all the wonderful ways that God has met my needs. From, from the very beginning of my Christian life, all through it, I, I could tell story after story, as well as many of you could still, tell me so many stories and testify to how God has proven himself faithful to meet our needs. I think back to, I think back to the early days of our marriage. Boy, God met my wife and I's needs. I think back to Bible college. We went to Bible college, uh, poor as dirt, and went there, and I don't even know how we sometimes made it through, but God just provided so many wonderful things in so many wonderful ways, and I wish I could just tell you the stories of those days. I, I think about when I went to Bakersfield and getting the church going there and seeing God meet the needs there for, uh, for two decades. And, and then even here, starting this church here in Stockton, Missouri, and just seeing how God has provided and the blessings that God has poured out upon us. And as I preached last Sunday morning, I preach about the subject of overcoming fear. 
And I've noticed that as I listen to the news and listen on the radio, and, I, and sometimes it can be so discouraging here, some of the stuff that's said, but one of the things that I have heard over and over again is that there is a, a lot of financial fears right now. And, it's, and, and it is, of course, understandable. And because all the people out of work, over 16 million people are out of work and, and getting unemployment and businesses that have been shut down and say, they're saying some may not be able to open and, and just so many things that are taking place in our country. And so people are having financial needs. Some people are wondering how they're going to make it. Most people live from check to check. And, and not only that, but even when circumstances are good, they say that one of the top three fears that people have is this, is this thing of financial fears. And it doesn't matter how good things are. In fact, they say, I wouldn't know, but they say that the more money you have, the more worries you have and the more fears you have. Now, I, I've not had that concern in my life. But, but it is. It's true. People have financial fears. And yet, you know what? As a child of God, as a child of God, I'm talking to you, Christian, tonight. I'm talking to you, church member, tonight. I, I, you need to know that you have a God that will meet your needs and take care of you. And this verse, Philippians 4, 19, this is an awesome verse. This is an awesome promise. God, a promise, by the way, that ought to diminish your fear, and maybe even delete it. Maybe even get rid of it. This verse, look at it again. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Now, I'd like to just take every word almost in that verse and preach that to you. But, but notice he says God shall. God's putting his character on the line here. God says, I promise you. This is what I am going to do. We've all had people that have made promises, I'm going to do this, and have not done it. And it puts a nick or a kink into their character. Not God. God says, I'm going to do this. God says all. Not some. Not most. He says all. He says needs. All your needs. As somebody has said, not all your greeds, but all your needs. Not all your wants. But all your needs. You know, anybody who's a parent, I believe, would, would think the same thing I'm thinking right now. Any parent that gives their children everything that they want is making a huge mistake. And if you do that, I hope you stop doing that. Parents, you understand that everything your kids want is not what they need. And probably there are some things they want they shouldn't have. And, as, and God is the same way. I'm glad God doesn't give me everything I want. God knows what's best for my life. But I'm also on the other side of that coin. I'm happy to say that God doesn't just give me my needs and meet my needs. But I'm glad that sometimes God does give me my wants. And there are things that they're not a need, but I pray for and ask for it. It's just a want. I can live without it. And he gives it to me. And there are some of you, if I, you had to say, raise your hand if that's happened, I guarantee you almost every Christian could say, you know what, that's so true. I think wanted, don't really, didn't really need them, but I wanted them, and God gave them to me. And so God says your needs. God says according to his riches. And I got to tell you, God has more than enough riches to meet everybody's needs. And then he says, by Christ Jesus. So please be clear here. This is not for unsaved people. This is for saved people. This is a promise to a child of God. This is a promise to somebody who's trusted in a living Savior, in a loving Savior, in a saving Savior. And so in that context, this verse is an amazing verse. This, this promise is an amazing promise. Every Christian ought to memorize this verse. Every Christian should be meditating on this verse. And with this with this promise and every promise, let me say this, there are conditions, there are prerequisites. There are some things that you need to be doing to see God meet your need. Because I want you to have the joy. The joy of seeing God meet your needs. And it is a joy when, when God does do that. So let me give you this morning some conditions, or rather this evening, some conditions to help us 
to see and to have the joy of God meeting our needs. First one is this. Number one, God will meet my needs if I ask fervently. God will meet my needs if I ask fervently. Uh, if you have your Bible, turn over to James chapter 4, verse number 2. And you'll notice in this verse, it starts off kind of, if I could say it this, weird. But look what it says. It says, ye lust and have not. Ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight in war. Now, I wish I could take time to explain that, but that seems kind of odd. But then look what he says. He says, yet ye have not. Look it, because ye ask not. Let me say that again. Ye have not because ye ask not. Later on in that book, he tells us the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man, finish it, availeth much. So the first thing we need to understand is this. God, God wants to meet your needs, but many times he's waiting for you to ask. He wants you to ask. Somebody has said this, God shuts the storehouse often because we shut our mouth. God's just waiting sometimes for you to start to ask him. Uh, God wants to help us. I believe that with all my heart. He wants to us to ask, and he wants us to ask fervently, fervently. Oh, my soul. I love this psalm. One of my favorite psalms. Turned there many times. And the very First two words of that psalm, two of my favorite words when it comes to this subject. Here's what he says, Psalms 12, 1. You don't need to turn there. In fact, you probably memorize it after this. Listen, help, Lord. <laughs> help, Lord. How many times have you said that? Help, Lord. That was David. And boy, by the way, I can't see David saying, help, Lord. Uh-uh. He says, help, Lord. And God wants some passion to be in this thing. God says we need to say help. I think of the Canaanite woman who came to Jesus in great need because she had a daughter who was vexed, the Bible says, by a demon. And the Bible says in Matthew 15, 25, then came she and worshiped him saying, Lord, help me. Lord, help me. You know, sometimes when it comes to our needs, it doesn't have to be a long prayer. Doesn't have to be all these words. Honestly, sometimes it's just, Lord, help me. I'll tell you what, there's times I've gone out, walked somewhere, and all I would say the whole time is, Lord, help me. Lord, help me. Lord, please help me. Lord, I need your help. Please help me. And God doesn't get tired of it one bit. You know, the joy of God meeting your needs means you need to ask fervently, you need to come to the Lord. I think of Matthew chapter 7, verse 7. I consider this a prayer teaching fervency. He says, ask, and it shall be given you. But it doesn't stop there. He says, seek, and ye shall find. It doesn't stop there. He says, knock, and it shall be open. He says, ask. He says, if that, that doesn't work, keep asking, of course. But seek. If that doesn't work, then knock. He says, man, get with it, man. Get with it. You know what I love about that? It's it, ask, think about it, seek, and knock. It's an acrostic, A-S-K. Ask, that's the bottom line. Maybe it may be just simply asking. It may be seeking. While you're asking, you're seeking. You know, put footsteps to your prayers, as they say. Maybe it means knocking. Maybe you need to start knocking on doors and looking and seeking. But the bottom line, there ought to be fervency. And even the tense, if you look into the Greek, it's an aorist tense, which simply means asking and asking and asking and asking and asking. You just keep asking. You keep seeking. You keep knocking. Listen, God wants to meet your needs, but sometimes it has to be, you just fervently are asking and seeking. Oh, that's why the Bible says in Matthew 6, 32, it says, for your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. Now think about that. Before you even ask, God already knows what you need. Would you agree with that? I see you, I see you out there nodding your heads. Abs Brother Joe's nodding his head, absolutely. God knows everything. God knows everything. So God knows every need that you have. And all God wants oftentimes to meet the needs in your life is he just wants you to ask. G listen, give God a chance. Give God a chance. And the way that you give God a chance is you ask and ask and ask and ask. I read this quote, before you pay, pray. 
Man, pray and ask. You say, why does he want me to pray? He already knows my name. Why doesn't he just give it to me? Now, really, I think there are several answers there. But can I give you an answer to go with the message? God wants you to have joy. Now, if God just gave me everything I wanted, now think about that. I would end up taking God for granted. I don't think there'd be much fun. But when I get on my knees or I walk somewhere and ask God and ask and ask and ask, and then it, and I don't tell anybody else, and I get it, it comes in the mail or somebody comes by and gives it to me or God just works something out that I get it. Can I tell you something? There's joy unspeakable there. I mean, there is such a joy, and so many of you understand that joy. I mean, it, it, it wasn't an accident. It, was, it just, it was God. It was God. And you asked him for it, and your heavenly Father gave it to you. That's what Jesus said, John 16, 23. And in that day you shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Listen, hitherto have ye asked nothing in my name. Ask, and ye shall receive that your joy may be full. Amen. There is just something so wonderful when you ask God. Nobody else, and you ask God, and he answers your prayer. Oh, and, by, and then, listen, God's so smart. God's so wise. And then when you get so joyful about God answering prayer and seeing what God does, guess what? Then you become a good advertisement for God. God says, that's what I, I want this to be a joyful Christian. And one of the best ways to be a joyful Christian is, is start praying and start seeing God meet your needs. Boy, that'll, that'll put unction, umption in your gumption. Uh, that'll, that'll even put gas in a Ford, amen? That'll keep you trucking, man. That'll keep you surfing, man. Hey, that, put, give me oil in my lamp. Keep me burning, 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 as the song said. And I'll tell you one of the best ways to keep burning, burning, burning. Pray and ask God. Pray and ask God and see God answer your prayer. See God meet your needs. Ha, that's the first thing right now. How can I see God meet my needs? He'll meet your needs if you ask fervently. Uh, number two, God will meet my needs if I live contentedly. Now, this is a loaded gun right here. And I'm going to tell you, this is the hardest thing for me and for everybody else. To live contentedly. Look at Philippians chapter 4, verse 11. Notice, this comes before 19. Uh, not that I speak in respect of want. For I have learned, in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. Can I tell you, sometimes what we think are needs are not needs. You say, I prayed for this need. But God said, you know what? You don't need it. And one of the ways that God helps you, in a sense, meet your needs, is by getting you to be content with what you already have. Amen? To be content. So, Paul's in jail. Let's not forget the content here again, context. He is in jail, and he's content. Now, I, I understand being content. I feel like that there is a, I do have a certain amount of content. But, but to be in jail, in the jail he was in, and yet Paul said, I learned to be in whatsoever state I am to be content. So I have to take from that that Paul was content to be where he was. Paul understood that he was there because that's what God wanted, and he was content to be there. Absolutely amazing. So living contentedly is a matter of your attitude towards situations and toward things. Here's the problem. This world does not help us one bit in living contentedly. Good night, this world is constantly throwing things out, promoting things, telling us you need this, you need this, you need, and making bigger and better things. Okay, uh, for some people it's cars. You, got a, you just got this new car, and, and then a year later, a better car comes out, and you're thinking, I want that. 
I say, I, 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 that's not me. I am not that kind of a person. I have never been a car guy. I, I got my Jeep. That Jeep is old. That Jeep's got almost 200,000 miles on it. And honestly, I haven't thought one thing. Say, boy, I wish I had this now. After I get rid of it, I'll get a truck one of these days. But I just, that is not one of my issues is truck. I'll tell you what, lately it's been, man, I get these Bass Pro newspapers and I get these catalogs, I start looking through there. I looked at a tree stand that was a chaise lounge almost, man. It's a lot. You lie back, you got a cooler up there. You got uh, cup holders up there. I mean, you got the kitchen sink up there. You got a portable bathroom up there. I'm just kidding. But you got about just about everything. And I look at it and think, man, I'd like to have that. Or they got this you know, new gun or this new scope, or, uh, this new red dot scope for the shotgun or this new turkey shotgun. Oh my goodness, new turkey call. And you know what? I've, I've got enough. I've already got turkey calls. I've got hunting clothes. I've got guns. I don't need a thing. But you know what? I get in the world. It's the world. It's not my fault. It's the world's fault. I, get, I look at it. I think, man, I'd like to have that. And its truth is, it's not easy living content. And unfortunately, sometimes we're not happy unless we get something. And we're not satisfied sometimes till we get something. But yet, let me read to you 1 Timothy 6.6. 6. Listen. But godliness with contentment is what? Great gain. I have that verse in my office. I look at it so many times, godliness with contentment. And I love it. I love the picture. It's, it, it, it's, a, it's a painting. It has a young man um, uh, leaning. He's, got, he's in, standing partway in a river, and he's leaning against a big old tree. He's got his fishing vest on. He's got his fishing hat on. Beautiful river right there. He's got his fishing pole out there. And it says, godliness with contentment. Amen. Oh, man, I look at that. And, hey, that's to me the picture. Of, man, I'm out there. I got my fishing pole. I'm content. And contentment is great gain. It is a wonderful thing. And he says, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain. It is certain. We can carry nothing out. Have you ever had a baby come in the world with something? Oh, came out, baby. And then all of a sudden, the baby's got its hand on a suitcase and pulling a suitcase out. That's a dumb illustration. I agree. <laughs> and you mothers right now are thinking... Thank God. <laughs> Thank God. Hey, baby comes in this world with nothing. <laughs> Brother Joe's making me laugh here. With nothing. And you know what? When we go out of this world, we leave with nothing. We leave with absolutely nothing. You know what the Bible says? Having food and raiment, let us be there, there with content. You know, Think about the world we live in today. You know, if you knock on doors, you go out and visit folks, you know what you find? Everybody almost has a garage, but you notice a lot of times cars are parked outside the garage. You know why that is? Because if you open up that garage door, it's filled with stuff. Do you know in California, one of the things you find, in Cal there's storage facilities cropping up everywhere. Daryl Storage is real popular in California. And it used to make me chuckle. It'd say, Daryl Storage coming. Here we grow again. Here we grow again. And I had a song leader for many years, Brother Pete Van Dyke. And he was like, that, that just bugged the fire out of him. He'd say, man, people have so much stuff. Man, they, 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 they got to rent storage facilities and they put it in there and they leave it and there rots in there oftentimes. Do you get what I'm saying? We live discontentedly. We're always wanting more. We're always wanting better. And yet, God says we need to live content. See, one of the ways you get your needs met is you lose your needs, the desire for things. Don't, don't get caught up in when thinking, W-H-E-N thinking. Don't get caught up in that. When I get that gun, then I'll be happy. When I get that house, then I'll be happy. When I get that raise, then I'll be happy. When I get that car, then I'll be happy. When I get that uh, uh, new riding lawnmower, then I'll be happy. Don't get caught up in when thinking. Contentment means my happiness is not dependent upon the things that I have nor the circumstances that I am going to. And by the way, don't get caught up in comparing 
One of the things or the enemy of contentment is comparing. And when I was writing that down, I thought of this. Don't keep up with the Joneses. And I thought, you know, we all know, what, we all know that expression. I thought, where did that come from? You ever do that? You think of something and you think, how did that ever get started? I've done that with so many phrases. Cup of Joe. Look up one day. Where did that come from? Cup of coffee. Where did it come from? A cup of Joe. I already know. Now you need to go find out. Don't do it while I'm preaching, by the way. Cup of Joe. But what about keeping up with the Joe? You know what I found? I looked it up. It was actually a comic strip. This started back in 1915 or 13, and it actually went up to 1940. It was a comic strip. And the comic strip... Uh, the, the, the main family there was the McGinnis family. And it depicted this family, and they had neighbors that were Joneses. You never saw the neighbors. You never met the neighbors. You never saw anything they had. But the whole strip was, was, was bent on the understanding that the McGinnises were always looking at what the Joneses had. And if the Jones got a new car, then we need it. We go, hey, honey, did you see the Joneses got a new car? We got to get a new car. Or the Joneses got a, uh, a, a, a new lawnmower. You see that? The Joneses got a new lawnmower. We got to get a new lawnmower. The idea is, and by the way, it was based on the mentality of how many people are, is that we got to keep up with everybody. We got to keep up with our peers. We got to, you know, my friend got a cell phone, so I got to get a cell phone. Uh, my friend got this, so I got to get this. My brother got this, so I got to get this. My parents have this, so we got to get this. And we get so caught up in keeping up with the Walkers or keeping up with the, with the Wilsons or keeping up with the Listlins or the Zoopers. I mean, we get caught up with keeping up with everybody. And as a result of that, we become discontent with what we have because they got something better or they got more than me. Man, or how about this? You go hunting and the guy comes in, hey, did you see the new gun I got? And you're thinking, oh, that's really nice. And you're thinking inside, man, why do he have to get that gun? I, I, I need to get that now. Oh, man. my dad was big into electronics growing up. And my dad played in a band, had his own band every weekend. He played every Friday, usually Friday night, Saturday night he played. And all that extra money he got from that, he put that in another sa uh, 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 account or saving. And he used that to buy things, hunting things, and he used that on the side. And, but my, his, some relatives in, in my family, man, my dad would get, boy, this new thing come up, my dad would get it. And sure enough, my Uncle Tommy would say, boy, I'm going to get that too. My Uncle Bob would say, boy, I need to get that too. Nikki always has. Nikki always has the new stuff. Man, Nikki got that. I'm going to have to get that. And that's where we are. We look at what other people have. And we, we let what other people have determine our contentment. And I, I, I strugg everybody struggles with it at times. All I'm trying to say, if you want to have joy in seeing God meet your needs... Learn to live content. Learn to live content. <laughs> I think about this uh, man was moving into a house and there was a, a Quaker, a devout Quaker, leaning on the fence as the new neighbor is moving in. Now the new neighbor's, new neighbor's moving in. He's got all these modern appliances, electronic gadgets, plush furniture, costly wall hangings. I mean, he's got everything. He's looking over. Finally, the neighbor came out, and as he was going back into the house, he looked over at him, and he said to him, he said, neighbor, he said, if you find you're lacking anything, let me know, and I'll show you how to live without it. Amen. He saw, here's a guy that's caught up in things. He's got all these things. And the Quaker said, I, I've learned to live without it. Boy, wouldn't life be cheaper if we would learn to live without some things? I'm preaching to myself here. Truth is this. Maybe one of the best aspects of seeing God meet our needs is realizing it isn't a need at all. Maybe realizing I can live without that. I really don't need that. I had a friend of mine who told me that he has a credit card, one credit card, and here's what he does. To keep himself or just kind of spur of the moment thing, go out and buy something with his credit card. He took his credit card and he put it in a big bucket or something. It was this big, I forgot what it's called, like one of those water bottles that you have in your house that you can tip it over and you get your water from it. He stuck it in that and then he froze it. 
And so what if he wanted to go out and buy something, he's tempted to use his credit card, that he'd have to take it out of the freezer and it would have to thaw before he could get his credit card. And what he found was the majority of time, by time it thawed, he thought about it. By, I like the way that's, he, before, while, while it was thawing, he thought. And he realized, you know what? I really don't need that. Pretty good idea. Amen? And it worked for him. But what he, what, see, what he found out is, sometimes you think, boy, I got to get that, I got to get that, I got to get that. And when you talk, and you really think about it, and you kind of stand back and look at it, you think, you know what? I really don't need that. I really don't need to, in, to get in debt to get that. I could wait. We could save for that. So we're talking about having joy and seeing God meet your needs. How do you do that? Praying fervently, living contentedly. Number three, God will meet my needs if I give faithfully. If I give faithfully. Turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse number 6, would you? 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse number 6. Notice with me. But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give. Not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver, and God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that ye always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. Basically, God is teaching us that if we will be faithful in our giving, God will be faithful in providing our needs. Now, i got to remind you that God, when you give, He doesn't just look at the amount. He looks at your attitude. Did you notice those words there? Did you notice the words grudgingly? Did you notice the words of necessity? In other words, don't do it with a bad attitude, grudgingly. Don't do it because you have to do it. What does he say? God loveth the what? Cheerful giver. You know this, but the word cheerful is hilarious. I mean, will you just, just you know, comes from your gut and you just laugh heartily and man, you're just having a good laugh. Isn't it great to have a good laugh? That's what he's saying. You got to have the right attitude, right spirit. But God says if you'll give and you'll give with the right attitude, God will provide for you. God says, I'll take care of you. I think of Proverbs eleven twenty four. there is a scattereth and yet increaseth. You get that? Scattereth yet increaseth. And there is that withholdeth more than is meat, than is necessary. Sometimes you have to withhold. So, you know, there's some wisdom in saving. God's not against saving. God's not against us putting some things to the side. Or something in the future. God's not against that. God's not saying, boy, you can never have any savings. You got to give it up. No, he's not saying that at all. He says, there is that withhold us more than is meat, more than you need to. But it tendeth to poverty. God is using this idea that if you give away, if you give it, you will be increased. Now, I'm not a prosperity gospel preacher. I've heard preachers, you know, give God 20 and God will give you 40 back. No, I don't believe that for a minute. But I, believe, I do believe the Bible, though. And God says, you give, God says, he'll give back. God says, you scatter, God says, you'll, you'll get, you'll increase. But if you hoard and you give nothing, then guess what? You will get nothing. God won't give to you. And he uses the analogy of farm. Okay, picture a farmer, he's got four bags of seed. He looks at a barren field out there, and he says, boy, I'd sure like to have crops. Boy, I'd like to have a good harvest this year. And so he says, but, man, I don't want to use all this seed. Hey, tell me something. Isn't that dumb? How in the world are you going to get a crop if you don't take the seed out of the barn and put it out there? So here's what he does. He takes that seed, he puts it all over that thing, and he scatters it all out there, and, and the harvest comes, and you know what he finds? He finds, I don't know, does he have four bags of seed, but he has maybe 40 bags of seed now. That's how he multiplies it. He doesn't multiply it by keeping it. He multiplies by taking it out, by scattering it, by giving it. Wouldn't that be dumb for the farmer to say, I just can't afford to put that seed out there? Well, friend, you're going to be broke then. You're going you're to be in poverty. You're not going to get anything back. And that's all God is saying. 
When we hold back from giving, God holds back from giving. And every Christian has learned that in some way. Proverbs eleven twenty five: The liberal soul shall be made fat. And he that waters shall be watered also himself. That means a generous man will be a prosperous man. God will bless him. That's the application. The generous man will be prosperous, but and he who waters will himself be watered. What a great promise. And there's joy there. When you give, God indebts himself to us. Isn't that great? God says, if you'll give, I will, I'll, I'll take care of you. I will meet your needs. Now, to the world, this is very illogical, isn't it? And when I first got saved, it was illogical to me. It, it didn't make sense to me because I, I didn't know anything about the Bible. But you know what? To God, it's very logical. God says, you just give. In fact, let me read the verse. Give, this is God's logic. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Anybody can, a kid can, a four-year-old, five-year-old, hey, you give, it'll be given to you. That's simple. And look what he says. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that ye meet, with the, it shall be measured to you again. And I think everybody understands that. And I'm not going to go and explain it. But here's what I want to say about that. Man, listen. God is so many ways given me so much more than I've given him. Sometimes I think about my giving and I'm ashamed. I should be giving more and doing more for the Lord. But the truth is, God has been so good to me, given me so many wonderful things, so many wonderful blessings, and I believe, as many of you believe, given it shall be given unto you. I think of Proverbs 3, 9, Honor the Lord with thy substance, and with the first fruit of all thine increase, so shall thy barns be filled with plenty. Can I, you know, every morning, uh, you know this, I use the Lord's Prayer. There in Matthew 6, you know, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Give us our daily bread. Right there, I always stop. I use this as, a, as an outline for my prayer life. Every day I ask God to give me my daily bread. But you know, so many times I say, Lord, now, Lord, you know and I know I have everything I need in my house right now. I've got bread, I've got, I've got uh, meat, I've got snacks, I've got uh, beef sticks, I've got cheese, I've got, my goodness, we've got leftovers from, from two or three meals. I mean, good night. I really don't need daily bread. I've got, but, but I just want God to know that I am trusting him and that I am depending on him. And the truth is, God give. I don't know, but everything could be gone. How many people have tornadoes in this, in, in, in this area of the country, ha have had tornadoes, even recent days, go through? Everything they own is gone. Everything. I've seen on the news people standing outside, rubble, and all that they've owned, it's all gone. Everything. And every time I see that, I think that could happen to me. That could happen to me. And so we say, Lord, I, I, right now, I do, I have what I need. And you've been so good to me. And, but I also know, I don't know what this day holds. And I know that if God forbid anything should happen, that I should lose everything. Or something happened, I don't have it. Lord, I know you give. Can I tell you something? That the, the assurance and boldness that comes in that prayer you know why it comes? Because, because I know that I'm giving. Can I tell you something? When you're not giving, it's pretty hard to pray that prayer. It's pretty hard to pray, Lord, I know you'll take care of me, you know what will happen when you know in your heart. Now, you might say it, but in your heart you're thinking, man, I haven't even given the tithe in a long time. I used to give the missions, but I just stopped that. You get what I'm saying? You, you got to give. You want the joy of seeing God meet your needs? Well, you ought to give. God, honor the Lord with thy first substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase, so shall thy barns be filled with plenty. You'll have plenty. And thy presses shall burst out with new wine. I don't know about you, but that's how I feel. 
I have plenty. Truth is, I have more than I deserve. And I think one of the reasons why is because I've learned to give. And God has just been so gracious and so kind. God says he'll meet my needs if I pray fervently. God says I'll meet your needs if I live contentedly. God says I'll meet your needs if I give generously. And then last thing, number four, God will meet my needs if I trust completely. I trust completely. Matthew 6, you could quote it, but seek ye first the kingdom of God, say it with me, and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Here's the principle. You have to put God first in your life. God's going to be have first place in your life, and if you'll do that, I believe God will meet all your needs. Money needs, material needs, car needs, home needs, whatever it is. God will meet that needs. Why? That's what Jesus said. He said in, Roman, in Matthew 6, 31, Therefore, listen, take no thought. Don't worry about it. That's what he means there. Don't take thought. Don't worry. Take no thought saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or wherewithal shall we be clothed? Listen, for all these things do the Gentiles seek, unsaved people seek, pagans seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. You know, it, it, you know what helps me? It helps me think back when I was a kid. This, this always helps me. I think back to when I was a kid, I never had a wonder or a worry about where my needs was going to be met. You say, why is that? Because I had a dad. And my dad worked, got up early. I remember he'd get up 3 o'clock every single morning. And he went off to work about 4.30 in the morning, every morning. I sometimes remember waking up and the lights on and go out there. And dad's getting ready early, early in the morning. And I never worried because I knew my dad went, went to work. I knew my dad made money. And I knew that if there was ever a need, not a want, but a need. My, my dad didn't give me everything I wanted, that's for sure. <laughs> dad, I want this. Get a job. <laughs> Go cut some grass. Go shovel, go shovel some driveways. I had a little bucket in my, every one of my brothers and sisters had a little bucket in my dad's um, little uh, closet where he kept it locked all the time. And uh, we all had a, Joey and Robin and Nikki and Mark and Michelle. And that's where our money went. Dad would take some of my money and say, you need to put this away and save it. And so many things that I wanted, I had to pay for. But when it came to my needs, didn't fret, didn't fret where I'm going to get my clothes, uh, my tennis shoes get worn out. Oh, you know, I wasn't have to walk and say, look at the holes in my shoes. I, if I needed new shoes, my mom went out and got them because my dad made sure I had clothes and shoes to wear. Food, good night. We had some of the, my mother was one of the best cooks in the whole wide world. And I never came to the table and said, it looks like we're only going to have bread and water today. Oh, praise the Lord, it never came to that. David said, I've never seen the righteous forsaken. Never. And I'm just saying, I think back, and I had a dad. And the bottom line is, how I trusted my dad. How much do you trust God? How much do you trust God? Now listen, we only have two options in life. Listen, worry or trust. That's it. Only options you have. There are some folks, they live worried all the time. All the time. They're worried about this and they worry about that. Or you can live trusting. Now, for a Christian, for a, I can understand unsaved people worrying. God bless them, help them. But a Christian, a Christian ought not be worrying about things. You know what worrying is? It's a form of atheism. Worrying is not believing that you have God that takes it, and it's saying, I'm gonna, it's depending on you to get this. Trusting God says, I depend on him, and I'm trusting God to meet my needs, and I am giving, and I am praying, and I'm making sure that I'm not always coming up with all this stuff, and I'm, I'm living contentedly in my life, and boy, if I just trust God and live that way, you know what? God will take care of my needs. And to put anything else 
in the place of God. I'm talking about your job. I'm talking about investments. I'm talking about mutual funds. I'm talking about uh, 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 your living trust. I I'm talking about inheritance. I'm talking about all the things that people put their trust in, anything that you put before God, you're going you're to end up living the rest of your life always worried about it. Always worried about it. What if this happens? What if this happens? What if this happens? Now, praise the Lord, I've been able to start like what they call a 401k thing. And I, I went to look at it the other day and it's not looking very good right now. I, I've lost. Like everybody else has lost. But you know what? Didn't bother me a lick. I didn't say, oh no, what am I going to do? Didn't think about it. Like said, oh well, no big deal. No big deal. Hey, my father owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Silver and gold, this world is his. Everything's his. If I get it, praise the Lord. If I don't get it, praise the Lord. That's the bottom line of this whole thing. You say, why, preacher? Because I'm doing the very best I can to trust God. Trust him. Trust him. That's what I'm saying. The Bible reminds us anyways that we can lose it. So easy to lose. He says in Proverbs 23, 5, Wilt thou set thine eyes upon that which is not? For riches certainly make themselves weak. Somebody say amen. Boy, I tell you what, easy come, easy go. They fly away as an eagle toward heaven. How many can say amen to that? I can, listen, I'm telling you, I know people that have hundreds of thousands of dollars and lost it all. Boy, I'm thinking, well, I'm thinking of people right now had their entire retirement. I mean, had a lot. And it, just, it's, it, it was gone. Somebody swindled them, gave them some false information. Boy, and how sick and how sorry that was. But it just reaffirms what the Bible says. Money can just fly away. Flies away. Proverbs eleven twenty eight 28 says, He that trusts in his riches, in his riches shall fall. You're going to fall. You're going to stumble. You're trusting in your money. Oh, my friends, listen to me. My trust and your trust needs to be in God. You know, when I pastored in California, the deacons in our church counted the money every Sunday night. And I would tell them, text me how much came in for this and for this. I said, text me. And in and, 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 and the early years of pastoring, boy, I tell you what, Monday for me, if it was a good offering, Monday was a good day. If it was a bad offering, Monday was a bad day. I always cut my grass Monday morning. And I'd be cutting my grass. And I love cutting my grass. I love it. I just love doing it because it's, it's, it's therapeutic for me. And as I'm cutting my grass, I'm thinking, I'm adding up in my mind, okay, that came in. This has got to get paid and this has got paid. I'll be honest with you. I, I worry. Here was what I was doing. I was trusting in offerings. I was trusting in all. What a wonderful day came into my life when I finally learned to not trust in offerings and trust in God. Now, <laughs> don't get me wrong. I still wanted to know what came in. But if it came down, I didn't say, oh, me. I'd say, praise the Lord. God's going to take care of us. And that's the way Christians should live. That's the way every Christian should live. And, 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 and listen to me, listen to me. Your, the way you deal with money, the way you feel about money and treat money tr determines your faith. It determines your spiritual riches. Did you know that? One of the litmus tests for a Christian is how do you handle your money? What does money mean to you? Oh, let me read you the verse. If, ye, if therefore ye have not been faithful in unrighteous mammon, money, who will commit to your trust the true riches? The true riches are not diamonds, not, not gold. It's spiritual riches. I'm talking about joy. I'm talking about peace. I'm talking about God's provision. How can God entrust us with true riches if we haven't learned to take money and use it in the right way? 
In other words, using it, but trusting God. Trusting God. Trusting the Lord. Proverbs, Psalms 111.5, He hath given meat unto them that fear him. He hath given meat unto them that fear him. He will ever be mindful of his covenant. God says, I'll always be, I'm always mindful of my promises. That Philippians 4.19, But my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches by Christ Jesus. God is always mindful of his promises. What do we have to do? We need to learn to trust the Lord. And by the way, if God was willing to give his own son for us, doesn't that mean that he'll, he's willing to give us anything else? What greater thing did God give us or person than his own son? In fact, he says that in Matthew 7, 11. If ye then be an evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? And I would say with that, trust him. Listen, if God loves me enough to do that, then he loves me enough to provide and meet my needs. I'm done. There is a blessedness. There is a joy in seeing God meet your needs. And getting on your knees or going somewhere and pray and say, God, I need this. Help me, Lord. Help me. Help me. Help. And, and God does it. You know, one of my favorite songs is... Um, God will take care of you. I love, be not dismayed, whatever betide, God will take care of you. Beneath his wings of love abide, God will take care of you. God will take care of you through every day or all the way. He will take care of you. God will take care of you. But, 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 there are conditions. Are you praying fervently? Are you living contentedly? Are you giving faithfully? And are you trusting faithfully? That's a simple outline for a great, great truth. I hope that you have already learned and will continue to learn the joy of God meeting your needs. Maybe you need to right now. Maybe there's something God just spoke to your heart about. Maybe you haven't been asking, praying. Maybe, you've just, maybe your prayer life has been near to null. Maybe you haven't been living contentedly. You always want more, want more, which means you need more money when really, truthfully you don't need some things. And maybe you haven't been giving faithfully or trusting like you should. Maybe you need to get on your knees and say, God, forgive me. Forgive me for this. Lord, help me to live the way your word says I should live. And then, Lord, I want to see. I want to see. The, I want to have and I want to see this blessed joy of you meeting my needs. Folks, God bless you. I look forward to the day when we will get to meet again. And I, I'm praying that it'll be soon. And I pray for you and love you and, uh, and trust you're doing well spiritually. Trust you're reading your Bible. Trust your praying. Trust, trust your walking with God. Don't let these days cause your spiritual life to go down. Let these days cause your spiritual life to go up. Would you do that? God bless you. I love you.